colleagues and family members. Uh, but we really should get started. It's been a great afternoon um, to provide today. So thank you all for coming. Um, welcome to our 27th annual uh, Canis lecture. Um, it's uh, my privilege to host this. I love being here. Uh, my name is Tracy Klein. I'm an associate director in the Department of Soil, Water, and Climate. Um, and I am the recent chair of this Kenis Lecture Committee, taking over from um, our esteemed Emeritus Professor Mark Healy, who is joining us today. Um, so I'm glad that Mark is going to be here. Um, the uh, Earl Kenis was our state climatologist from 1968 to 1986. He saw the transition of that office to the Department of Natural Resources, where it is now. So um, I want to thank him. The many members of the Kenis uh, Lecture Committee, who are um, everyone in the state climatology office, as well as many of the um, faculty in our department. Um, so the Kenis family um, endowed this lecture series uh, as a tribute uh, to Earl Kenis, um, and many of them are here today. If you don't mind, either just kind of standing up or waving if you're able, uh, so that we can recognize you. <laughs> quite far, but even if they haven't, you all have taken uh, time out of your um, busy schedule to come um, and hear about this wonderful science um, that, that uh, is, is Earl uh, Kenneth's legacy. So I really um, appreciate that. Um, the Don Baker family, Don Baker was also a member of my department, and, and they have um, been in endowment as well. We've combined both of those funds, and so um, the Kenneth Baker endowment um, brings um, distinguished speakers every year for this lecture series, and it also helps us fund um, student travel scholarships so that students can travel and present their research um, at, uh, at conferences, which they um, might not normally be able to do. So we really appreciate that. Thank you to others in this room or outside this room who've also donated to that fund. So thank you very much. Um, I want to I thank the Kenis Committee. I would like to thank um, uh, Carrie Jarko at JP Nordstrom and members um, of their staff in the office who have Run the logistics um, for this day. Um, we couldn't have it without them, so thanks, thanks very much for that. Um, I'll be back up here in a minute um, to uh, introduce our, our speaker, uh, but first, if you have any program, we have a couple things on the agenda. So, first, we want to have an award presentation. Um, it's always a nice opportunity when everyone in here is, um, is in this room once a year um, to recognize some of um, our weather observers who help provide data for the state of Minnesota, um, some who have had many, many years of service. Um, and so um, we'll have that. Um, and then call Dr. Conroy with our department head of conservation board. So if I can invite Pete Goulet um, of the State Climatology Office to show my back of um, the National Weather Service in Manhattan uh, to come up uh, for the word set up. Thank you. Thanks, Jason. Um, it's always good to honor uh, one of the rain gauge readers at, uh, at these events, and we had a special one today. Uh, unfortunately, he couldn't be here. He was taking his wife to visit for therapy. Uh, so uh, and I really think he's probably watching the weather. He just doesn't want to be inside. <laughs> so this is the honor Dave Worstead, who's been watching the weather for 57 years. Um, you can tell how long somebody's been watching the weather because they usually mention a big weather event. Uh, is a tornado? That's either uh, the 1981 Harbor, or some people may have the same Lake Erie tornado. Uh, 1965, Fridley, Mountain View tornadoes. For Dave, it's the 1951 Minneapolis tornado. I had to look that one up, I couldn't remember it at first. So, he was 14 years old, and he caught the weather bug, and immediately he found the closest National Weather Service, uh, back then Weather Bureau office, and there were two in the Twin Cities. There was one in St. Paul back then. He rode his bike there, and uh, somehow managed to find his way in there, and he would take the hourly observations for them while they would sometimes take a nap. <laughs> so uh, he became a volunteer reader in 1962. He actually moved to where he could uh, be a cooperative observer. Um, he wanted to be one of our readers uh, for 57 years. And uh, I'll read. Now, he stayed in contact with the Weather Bureau, and I'll read an inspection report from 1967 from state climatologist Don Haynes. Uh, observer is a weather bug. He bought his equipment with his own money. 
Uh, he had an electric thermograph in his shelter in late November. The wire leads shorted out and the shelter burned. Yeah. <laughs> Observer built its own new shelter, did an excellent job. It's made for white wooden house shutters. The structure is in the shape of a square box. It's effectively as good or better than our standard design at a far lower cost. I don't know if you guys <laughs> Uh, <laughs> records are outstanding. If all observers in our official network did half as enthusiastic and effective a job, we would quit worrying about quality control. And that inspection was in 1967. Just this week, he called our office, all excited about the low pressure, barometric pressure from the latest storm. So he still has the same enthusiasm he <laughs> when he was 14 years old. And Michelle's here with a little bit of a horn for, for him recognizing the long. Uh, we are so honored to have the opportunity today to thank the Ingrid staff for his years of service. Um, one thing I wanted to mention, because we have no one here today from Coco Ross, there's no one here to <laughs> um, that he's also a Coco Ross observer as well. He was one of the first people in Minnesota to sign up for Coco Ross. Um, they assign numbers based on um, when you sign up and you become number one, and the second person number two in that county. Pete is number one <laughs> and we're calculating um, how many observations Dave has taken over the years. When you count about 57 years of observations, he's taken 20,800 observations as a volunteer. So it's just incredible what he's done over the years. Um, it's just an honor to be able to be here and, and to share this story with everyone. Um, yeah, Luna, um, and we are also in charge of the National Weather Service for the work in Shanhassen. Um, he had a letter that we were in appreciation to Dave. And uh, uh, it just it basically talks about his years of service, but we will, he's going to make sure that he gets, gets the, the letter of uh, letter of, <laughs> I forgot the word something. <laughs> Back in 2014, the National Weather Service we, uh, actually um, considers him an honorary co-op observer because of his 50 plus years of service. So as mentioned in this letter, um, it's basically second to none when we talk about volunteer. It's just amazing. And because of that, we've also put together um, a special service award from NOAA and the National Weather Service for Dave and then um, to honor him for his service. So thank you to the, the Venus uh, family for making it possible for us to uh, talk about Dave today. And uh, thank you, Dave, so much for, for what you've done for everyone in Minnesota. And of course, first thing is about the Venus at midnight, right? So even you know, that, you know, not only that, one of the few that doesn't at midnight. So, Whoa. Uh, uh, Dr. Carl Rowland, if you can hand the microphone over. Yeah. Thanks so much, Pete, and uh, <clears throat> thanks, Tracy, and uh, welcome to the 27th Annual Keenest Lecture. And thank you to the Keenest family. I really enjoyed meeting with them at lunch today, seeing them uh, again. And uh, as Tracy said, this, uh, this Lecture series started uh, back in 1992 on Earl's legacy with the State Climate Office and with the University of Minnesota to honor Earl's legacy. So uh, I'm very appreciative of this lecture. It's one of our signature series um, uh, in, in the department. I'd also like to thank Nolan for, uh, for coming here to be our featured speaker. And uh, I definitely look forward to hearing about your uh, your, uh, your community engagement and uh, citizen science um, uh, as, as it related to the weather. It's going to be a very fascinating talk. But before we get to the lecture, I'd like to give a few uh, departmental updates. A lot has happened over the last year, as you know, when I say we retired, and we conducted a successful search to replace Mark Field's position. Happy to report that Dr. Heidi Yu. We all start as our new extension climatologist next July. Um, Heidi earned a PhD in geology with a climate emphasis from the University of Wellington in New Zealand in 2015. And 
and since then she's been the lead scientist for science communication and engagement with the uh, University of Washington Climate Impact Group. So she's got a lot of group, uh, uh, one, uh, stakeholder uh, uh, experience. Uh, we were able to hire Heidi on what we call Green Farms, which are dedicated funds approved by the Minnesota legislature to increase capacity in the college for agricultural production and natural resources. So in addition to Heidi, um, her husband, Dr. Uh, Peter Root, will also be joining the department as a uh, research assistant professor. Peter also earned a PhD in geology at the University of Wellington in 2015. Um, with an emphasis on paleoclimatology uh, using ice cores from the uh, Antarctic. He's currently a postdoctoral research associate in the Department of Earth Space Sciences at the University of Washington, and he's continuing his work on Antarctica ice core uh, tree scan. So it's going to be a very uh, fascinating subject to look at. Peter will be uh, partially funded with a departmental land and atmospheric science professorship, which um, comes from an endowment, very coincidentally, we uh, received an endowment from a, an anonymous donor in 2018, and we we're fortunate enough to have some of those funds to support uh, Valerie. We look forward to their uh, arrival next year, and hopefully, uh, be able to introduce that at the next Tina session. Another departmental news, we recently hired a soil health specialist, Dr. Anna Cates. Anna, can you just here she is? This is part of a joint effort with the um, Water Resources Center here at the University and the Minnesota Board of Soil and Water Resources. Anna received her PhD from the University of Wisconsin and will be working on extension of applied research programs related to improving soil health. So cropping systems. Finally, we've had one retirement. Um, and uh, since the last question this lecture, um, after 30, 34 years with the department, Satish, where's Satish? There he is. Satish um, retired this past spring. Uh, Satish's area of expertise was soil physics and hydrology. And in 2013, he was named the first Raymond Almaris Professor of Emerging Issues in Soil and Water and helped us a title until his retirement. Um, unfortunately, we have a bunch, bunch of constraints we haven't been able to fill that position yet, but it is a very high priority for the department. I hope to get that, uh, that you know, funding becomes available to get that position um, filled. And I know Satish and Mark went way back. Satish ran up signature lecture series similar, similar to this one in the spring on soil and water and I know Peter and Mark collaborated a lot over the years um, to, to, to put these lectures, uh, these lectures together. So that those are kind of the highlights and I would like again where's Tracy there you are. Uh, thank you again and the, and the climate group for coordinating this lecture series and again to the Keenest family for all their support for this very Thank you very much. Uh, 
um, for the National Science Day that, that President Obama put on for his friend that day. Um, another tidbit that I found out was that um, here in Minnesota, we love our national health curricula. Um, and if any of you are fans of This American Life, uh, no one is featured in one episode of that. That's right, I forgot about that. So I encourage you to, um, it's available. You can um, look it up and, and check it out. Um, so that's, uh, that's just a couple um, kind of pieces of evidence of, of how um, fantastic uh, science can be is um, and engaging. And so I'm um, really honored to. Uh, him today um, to talk about precipitation collection. It's so important. We realize that here in Minnesota, I don't think we need to uh, convince this. We just see how variable rainfall can be between Minneapolis and St. Paul. Having these measurements are crucial. It's important um, for us to understand <coughs> our weather patterns, to put into our climate patterns, right, to, to give us this history of uh, climate across Minnesota to inform the um, and then just how this data can be used um, for natural and water resources and all the people that need to make a decision with water and you know, um, where the situation is occurring. So, um, welcome. I'm going to walk past you and go get a ring. Check, right. check. This is a... It's a very nice one. <coughs> Al, when did you first see rain gauges? Oh. <laughs> I, I <believe> it. <laughs> My dad used to have a can. <laughs> All right, well, let's, let's tell a little story. I'm going to get comfortable here, if you don't mind. You can get comfortable as well. Ah. I can see you, yes. You can see the board. Ah, perfect. We can advance. <laughs> and if I hadn't explained it in the first place, you wouldn't say, what in the world is Kokoraz? Well, I didn't know what it was either until the day came that it took off. Uh, but it's the Community Collaborative Rain, Hail, and Snow Network. It started as the Colorado Collaborative rain and hail study. We didn't think uh, volunteers would be willing to handle snow. <laughs> so we were focusing on summer. We were only going to do a few summer storms, and we were, that's what our original intent was. And you'll see momentarily the origin. In fact, the origin came from one particular storm that really affected my life in a big way. And, uh, uh, <coughs> <clears throat> Excuse me. And as you'll see in a map that I show in a little while, there was a lot of rain in parts of town, and other parts of town had almost nothing. It's quite, quite a remarkable event. Uh, but actually, this whole network started longer than, ago than that because I happened to, this is my hometown. I, I would guess that nobody in this room has ever been to Royal, Illinois, but it's only a few miles off of Interstate 74, east of Champaign-Urbana, on the eastern edge of the, of the well, I don't know how to do, I, uh, describe it. Let's simply say there was nothing but corn and soybeans as far as the eye could see. But you didn't have to go very far to the east, and you started hitting the Vermilion River, and the, which had, headed into the Wabash, and it was a different landscape. But we were on the east edge of that. And I didn't realize at the time that we were in Illinois high country. <laughs> but it's actually sort of a crest of a divide between, between uh, the rivers that flow to the Wabash versus the ones on the west side of the county that flowed to, to the Illinois river and onto the Mississippi. And being the high country, we are now a wind energy zone. And there's, I go back to my hometown, and it's just covered with wind uh, turbines. And I always knew it was breezy there, but I didn't, didn't know it was going to be Illinois wind energy territory, but it is. And as you can see from that lower right picture, there is not much to the town. There was one block to the north was the school, one block to the south was the church. I lived by the church. 
Uh, so it was two block walk across town. And, uh, but on the east-west dimension, it was more like five or six blocks long. And unlike many little farm towns that have shrunk, Royal has actually grown by about 50% in the last, since I left in, it's gone from a population of 180 to maybe 270 because it's close enough to Champaign-Urbana that some people have chosen to, to live in the country and commute into town. Uh, I don't know what your heritage is, but I was, it was the people who settled that area were from, from northeast, northwest Germany, the low country. Uh, low Dutch was still spoken in, in some of the rural community there. And I never quite learned that, but I did learn to love the weather from an early, early, early age. As long, as long as I can remember, I, my eyes were glued to the window. If, and I, I was one of the kids who, if snow was in the forecast or was even mentioned, I would stay up as long as I could at night, turn on the light out over the driveway to see it, to illuminate the, the well, to see that first snowflake. Let's put it like that. And if, it, if a snowflake didn't come, it would be most distressing. And apparently I was sometimes grumpy at school on a day when the forecast had failed because I had not gotten near enough to sleep. But my parents learned that they couldn't change how I acted, that I just wanted to see that snow and they couldn't really, and they learned to just accept it and roll with it, which I appreciated. My favorite thing was hanging out with farmers. It was easy to do that because all there were were farmers. <laughs> Uh, and I love listening to their stories and listening to the old folklore. And I don't know if you've noticed, but weather folklore, which used to be a big topic, almost every fall, your climate offices used to always, in, starting in late August, the phones would start ringing and they'd want to know what the forecast was going to be based on weather folklore. Weather folklore has really faded in interest in the last 20 years. And it's because a whole generation that knew weather folklore are gone. And the young folks are just not into folklore. So interesting. I, I knew I'd get sidetracked by my introduction and we'll have trouble getting through the topic of the main subject. Uh, but I started delivering papers when I was nine. My grandson is about to turn nine. I can't imagine. I was actually a private businessman at that age. I had my own money. I could buy my own candy at the store. It was wonderful. Uh, and, but soon thereafter, I started reading the paper, and it didn't take much reading before I started reading little articles almost every month that came out written by the state climatologist of Illinois. And of course, the paper came from Champaign-Urbana, so, and the state climatologist was located at that time at the, at the University of Illinois, or near the Illinois State Water Survey. And so there was always stuff to read, and I would get extremely excited when I read Last month was 1.6 degrees above average. And, and other 10 and 11 and 12 year olds are probably, but, but I was very interested in that. I don't know why, I just was. Uh, couldn't help it. Uh, and, uh, and it wasn't, uh, oh yeah, I, I, I just literally spent most of my growing up years outdoors watching the weather loving the weather, feeling the weather, hearing the stories from the farmers. And literally, we could all forecast better than the old forecast used to be coming out of the weather service or from the vintage of the 50s and 60s. Uh, interestingly enough, my dad kept a journal, and that journal was consisted mostly of weather information and, and expense information. He didn't write a lot of personal notes. He kept track of where he went, what he did, what he spent his money on, and what the high and low temperature was, and what the precipitation was. Oh, no, did I remember my rain gauge? No. No, not the, the other rain gauge. The original rain gauge. Got to be in here. Are you in here? Come on, rain gauge. This First National Bank, Ogden, Illinois, was But, but don't let me leave without this today. But, the, but there, there it is. And that was what my dad kept his records with, which is why many of the readings were to the nearest quarter of an inch sometimes. <laughs> but 
when you're in wet areas, a quarter inch is often close enough. But I, I it turned out that it wasn't, it wasn't exactly close enough. Uh, but, but that's what I had to work with. And my, my dad would let me and my friends have access to his weather journals. And in the summer, on really hot afternoons when we weren't interested in being outside because it was just too hot, we would go downstairs in the basement where it was cool, we would pull out the weather journals, and we would do recreational climate statistics. <laughs> And I'm talking about 12-year-olds. And, and, and it was fun. I mean, what are the chances of having uh, snow on Christmas? That would be one of the things. And we go back through 20 years of the journal, and we find out how many times it snowed on Christmas. And, and how, how, what's the chances of thunderstorms on 4th of July? I mean, these were things that we did. And it was really quite exciting. And, uh, and of, of my closest friends, one of them went to the National Weather Service. So out of a town of 200, we put out a state climatologist and a lead forecaster at the St. Louis Office of the Weather Service, now, now retired. And the other two went into selling insurance, <laughs> which was also related to weather and statistics pretty well. So I, I would say my dad had an impact on us. Uh, and, uh, and but it was before I went away to college, and I don't know it was, if it was the year I went to college or the year before, but I got my dad a grand gauge that looked strangely like this. And it cost $25, which in 1969 was a lot of money. But I was proud to give it to him as my farewell as I was heading off to college so that he could keep better weather records than he had prior to that. And he did, he took it seriously. Uh, oh boy, I, I knew I'd get into this introduction too much. Uh, I was a pretty good student at school, despite being the preacher's kid and the teacher's kid, which was a bit of a problem, especially when you're in seventh grade. Uh, see, Al, what level did you teach? You were a little younger there, fifth and sixth, so the kids hadn't become too crazy yet. Uh, but I managed, if I could turn a homework assignment into a weather project, I would do really good. And I tried it every way possible, any assignment I get, if I could give it a weather bent. And finally, I actually got a little note from my English teacher in high school says, you should be a weather writer. I said, a weather writer? Well, it turned out I became a weather writer. I just didn't didn't know that that was a job. I mean, it's not exactly a job, but does, she could see that if, if I got writing about the weather, I would write with passion. About other things, no passion. But weather, passion. Uh, and, uh, and then uh, through my reading career, reading newspapers, sometimes if I found a really good article, I would just stop on the corner with my bicycle with the newspapers rolled up in the basket and start uh, reading articles and not delivering the papers. <laughs> Sort of made some of my customers mad. Also, sometimes I would stop and play football on the way to delivering the papers. It was an afternoon paper at the time. But I would read articles from Stan Shagnon. And some of you will recognize that name. He was your very first speaker in this series. And he was my hero when I was a high school student. High school students having climatologists as a hero? Fruitcake. Well, I also had baseball heroes, basketball heroes. I loved sports. but but uh, definitely had a climatologist as a hero and said, I would like to be like him. And apparently I gained a little bit of that. Uh, but then interesting thing, I did go on to college. I did, uh, didn't know you could actually get a profession in weather and climate at that time. My advisors in high school were not practically, were not particularly useful. But, Apparently, my undergrad student advisor wasn't that useful either, because they told me, do not go into climatology. It's a done, done field. It's dead. And this was an early 1970s perspective. And it, from an early 70s perspective, it was not inaccurate. The Weather Service was bailing out of climate. Uh, the state climate offices, which had been federally funded, were abolished in 1973. Earl was one of the survivors who transitioned from a federal position to a state position, which a few states were able to do that. Uh, many of them just lost the program, uh, but, and then had to rebuild it after that. 
But I managed in the summer of 1972 to land a weather field project job with a Metromax field project. And has anybody in this room heard of Metromax? Wow, there's some people that have. Amazing. But it was an urban climate study looking at the effects of uh, urban center and urban industrial center on air quality and subsequent storm development and precipitation downstream. And I got to participate in collecting rainfall, doing running radar, and doing all sorts of fun things as a college kid that was just uh, fascinating. Is it this? And it was applied climatology drawing maps of rainfall patterns from high density networks. I said, this is fun. I could do this for the rest of my life. And it, and it, uh, and it back to college, which actually was very hard and very boring. And the classes were not that fun and, and dynamic meteorology, you know, is good, but is just hard. And it, and it, but I, but thanks to the sum, knowing I had a job to go back to every summer for four years, it made it all very worth it. Uh, and in the end, I thought I, if I could just hang in there, I would get a job at the Illinois State Water Survey. It could work for Stan Shagnon. But alas, what happened? No job. Tears. <laughs> uh, but I, I did. I honestly purposely failed the qualifying exam. I was so fed up with college. And I did not, they wanted me to go on for a PhD and they wanted me to get involved in the National Atmospheric Deposition Program, which by the, by the way, this many years later still exists. And it was acid rain stuff, but I was just not interested in acid rain stuff. I wanted to do local climatology. Uh, there were no Very close to changing careers. I mean, I was this close. And, and I was good at selling popcorn, believe it or not. <laughs> uh, and, and in fact, the, there in 1977, it was more than from popcorn sales, because otherwise I was unemployed and looking for jobs and not having much luck. But I stuck it out because I could have gotten various jobs, but it, it just weren't, didn't feel right. Uh, and about in the late summer, nah, early summer of 77, I saw a job announcement on the wall published at the, at the University of Illinois saying, job opening, assistant state climatologist, Colorado. Assistant state climatologist? Now this sounds really exciting. A lab, but what did it require? Five years experience in mountain climatology. Where was I from? <laughs> The high, 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 high territory in Illinois. Oh dear. I, ha I thought, well, how, how could I describe this? I had spent almost two weeks there when I was seven in the Rocky Mountains on a family camping trip. And I'd returned in 19, in, in, when I was 18, just before going to college and camped in the Rockies for, for another seven days. And I had memories of certain things, and I built off those memories to make a case for why my three weeks in Colorado should count <laughs> for, for five years of experience. But what really, it turned out, what really counted was the fact that nobody with five years of experience was willing to work with what, for what they were willing to pay. <laughs> and someone like me was willing to work for almost nothing. And after three, four, or even five people turned down that first job opportunity, I got a shot at the job. And I, I had to hustle back to Illinois, sell one more game of popcorn, win, collect my prize for the most sales, and then rush back to, to Colorado to start my job in the fall of 1977. It was exciting times. And so the shift, the scene shifts westward. And if anybody knows the front range of, of Colorado, the two high peaks in the middle are in Rocky Mountain National Park there over the lake. And that's Long's Peak to the right and Mount Meeker to the left. Let's see, I can do it right there. And this is taken from a lake on the front range. And, and we do a surprising number of sunsets that look like this. And they're mostly this time of year. November, December is the best sunset times of year for the Front Range of Colorado. 
Uh, and alas, my dream job began. I was analyzing climate data. I was starting to maintain weather stations. That was fun. Answering climate-related questions. Ooh, I learned a lot trying to answer people's questions. Talking to farmers and reporters, I could handle that. Well, I learned to handle the reporter's part. The, the farmer's part was easy. Teaching kids and teachers, there were folks like Al out there. They were very teachable. <laughs> they were a joy to be with. Meeting fellow climatologists from other states. That I was trying to remember, when did I first meet Al? And, or when did I first meet Earl? Al and I would have met in the, when did you end up in Fort Collins for the first time? You came in 74, you came a little bit before me. You already were settled into teaching by then. But, but your dad came out a time or two and he introduced us and we all got together and, and we've sort of known each other ever since. And, uh, and my, the best part of my job is for all the years I was the assistant state climatologist, which was 29 years. I had no administrative responsibilities. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, but then you realize, yeah, I also had no power to influence anything. <laughs> and so I did become a state climatologist in, in 2006, and I got to have the headaches and the joys of, of uh, having uh, some administrative prop opportunities and chance to make projects fail or succeed. But it was so much fun. All of this was fun. Uh, and first and foremost, for that first decade of my career, nobody asked me anything about climate change and what I, did I believe in climate change? And, and that was very, in, in retrospect, we could, and I've always had total academic freedom of speech about the topic, and believe it or not, most state climatologists were skeptics for a very long time, for a very long time. And gradually evidence pointed in new directions and made it more convincing. And, and so that there's still some state climatologists who, who are cautious about the topic, but for the most part, it's become an accepted thing that humans are definitely having a big impact on the globe's climate. Uh, somewhere in this picture from 19, I think would have been 81, I think, Somewhere, I am in this picture, and I'm told that Earl is, and I can, I'm not sure if I can identify. I can, see a, I can see the old Texas state climatologist right there. I can see a Washington state climatologist. I can see a, a North Carolina state climatologist. And with care, I can figure out most of these people, and I'm not sure which one is Earl, and maybe he was just off the edge of the slide, but he's supposedly in that picture. Uh, this was the first precipitation map that I participated in when I came to Colorado. And this took a huge amount of effort because every one of those stations, I had to number one, figure out where in the world they were. I'd never heard of Pagosa Springs prior, prior to that. Wolf Creek Pass, downtown Pagosa Springs. Does that have a ring? Does that ring a bell to anybody? Anybody who, who was the, who wrote that? Who produced that song? Uh, say it again. I <laughs> You want to sing it for us? <laughs> Wolf Creek Passway up on the Great Divide, coming on down the other side. <laughs> Something like that. Uh, country, country song. Uh, but I had never imagined this kind of variability. And this is percent of average. This isn't just total precipitation. Uh, and that took a long time just to make that map, and I didn't draw any contours because I didn't know what I was looking at. But at least I got that done, and I was able to go home for Christmas. Uh, a few years later, I was beginning to draw contours, and we drew contours by hand for many years and had fun uh, doing so and thought that probably everything within that 50% of average contour there was probably above 50% of average. Now that I have way more dots on my maps, I know that it was way more complex pattern than, than uh, that, but we didn't know that. So you just drew a nice smooth curve to what you had to, to work with. I got, starting in 1982, got to take over the management of our campus weather station. I got to visit your campus weather station today, 
you have managed to preserve a rural setting in a beautiful way and don't let them steal the weather station from you. I've had to fight my, the Dickens just to keep this weather station, which if you, if you turn and look the opposite way, about 100 feet away is, a, is the campus transit center where all the buses come every 30 minutes coming and going. And they go in a circle around the weather station. We're an island. They've protected us as an island. But do you want to be in the middle of a bus depot for your weather station? We have one of the best warming trends in the country. <laughs> Our weather station has not moved, but the environment around the weather station has changed. And it's, it's made for interesting times. But you'll see a few rain gauges in that picture. You'll see a standard rain gauge there. You'll see a couple of rain gauge there. You'll see a universal there. You'll see a, anybody know what a Fisher Porter gauge is? Yeah, there's our Fisher Porter. There's our token example tipping bucket gauge. How many rain gauges does the weather station need? All of them. <laughs> Good answer. There's our evaporation pan. And we proudly maintain these. Ooh, it needed to be filled that day, I think. At least it was clean, I can tell that. Uh, but, uh, and, and there you're looking at ultrasonic depth sensors for the snow measurement on those snowboards. I mean, we're going after this measurement stuff. And if you look up, there's wind measurements. And if you look down, there's soil measurements. Do you realize what a soil temperature profile history your department has here? Unprecedented, I think. Is there anything like it in the world? And it's been run, it's still being run? Yep. This is awesome. We're proud of ours. It goes down to 10 feet and dates back to 1974. Yours goes down to 10 meters. That's pretty deep. That's quite the profile. And I'm really proud of what you've done and kept, keep it going, whatever you can. Uh, the pace began to quicken the, as we got into the late 80s. In many ways, the National Weather Service modernization was being planned. Automated surface observing system, ASOS, was being tested. State climatologists were getting concerned about what impacts this was going to have on climate data. NEXTRAD was being developed, which we were all pretty excited about, which is the radar. Definition of real-time weather data. Do you realize that in the, oh, you, you Jim, you handled this transition. Real time used to be considered within two weeks of the end of the, <laughs> of the month. If you had your, your data summarized and your reports out within two weeks at the end of the month, that was considered pretty real close to real time. And now real time is like five minutes ago. That's, not, that's ancient history. Uh, I, I recently got to make a case for some weather stations to the weather service. We were saying, well, would you, what time frequency do you want for your reporting? Would five minute frequency be sufficient? So, well, we take it if that's all you can have, but we'd sure appreciate more frequent updates than that if you could. So, oh. uh, the National Weather Service Cooperative Network was threatened, although we could say that every year for however long. Uh, and global warming, oh dear. And by the way, is my insurance, my contractor who just has finished doing about $50,000 worth of repairs to our home after a hailstorm last year. And he probably was wondering why we haven't paid him yet. Uh, well, I'll talk to him later. But global warming had been not a topic of concern, and, but it became a topic of concern starting, what, 88 was the hot summer? And when, when what was his, Hansen. Hansen spent a little time in, with Congress and, and things started to heat up on the great world of climate. Oh dear, too many words on the slide. Duskin is called, oh yeah, that was, I was proud of that. It's called a thorn in the side of the National Weather Service by your regional director in his office in Kansas City. It was pretty exciting. But he thought we were dragging our feet and slowing down the Weather Service and not letting them push ahead 
with automation that they thought was essential. It was important, but, but nevertheless, they needed to do it so that data coming out of the ASOS rain gauges in the 19, early 1990s, even in rain only environments, they were only measuring about 25, oh, about 75% of or 25% less than than standard rain gauges. And in snow climates, they were some places less than 25% of what was falling was being measured as precipitation. Now, the bad part of it is it hasn't all improved, but that's not for me to talk about today. Uh, there was grave concern over the US snowfall data and the survival of the co-op program. Climate change had definitely become a hot topic by the 1990s. Climatology becoming a compelling field once again. Of course, it always was, but there was just sort of a forgotten field for a few years. And lo and behold, and you'll see some of you walked past and said, are these available? I got to write my one and only book, The Snow Booklet. It's a small book about snow, but it, we managed to get the attention of the Weather Service and it resulted in some real positives and they have subsequently firmed up their snow measurement guidelines and improved their training materials. And I like, love their training materials because I'm a part of some of the training materials and I don't get older at all in those videos. <laughs> I, perfect. And, uh, and it's been very fun. And we also were under the very cognizant awareness that there was very poor hail data in the United States very little objective quantitative information other than the data collected by insurance companies, which is usually proprietary. Uh, and so we were trying to figure out what can we do to make things better? Oh, the last piece of the puzzle was moving to the farm. And a few of you in, the, in this room may know that I write a little thing called the catch to go with our Kokoro's communications. And I usually end it with a farm story about life on the farm. And my wife is a soil scientist, which has connected me to some other aspects of your, your department here. And, and she always, and my mother-in-law grew up on a subsistence farm, really, in eastern Colorado in, in the Dust Bowl years. And they both wanted a land and a farm for our kids to grow up on. And we managed to, this is right on the edge of Fort Collins, very close, but it, it's, we immediately moved back 100 years in time when we moved there. And I was having to cut firewood. We didn't have any central heat or anything. It was like, come on, this is, but it, our kids look back and say, those are the best years of our life. But that's our barn. There's our horses, our chicken coops to the right. And, uh, and this really has helped been one of the ingredients that has cemented the Kokoros community, believe it or not, is our old farm. Uh, 1997 came along and uh, I happened to have a chance to hire a high school student to help us study whether it was feasible to have kids help measure hail with hail pads. And the results were sort of mixed. There was some interest, but they said, it doesn't hail, even in a hail prone area, it doesn't hail often enough. And to keep interest and in high school kids. One of, my, one of my friends says, well, if you, you could measure something that happens like every day, maybe keep our attention. And then something happened in, on July 28th of 1997 that put it, brought it all together. And that was in fact our flood. This was, by the way, the building in the background there is the CSU engineering building underwater. The civil engineers were flooded. <laughs> Exactly the publicity you want. Uh, very close to campus, we had a, a wild, destructive evening because there a train crashed. A uh, uh, community of mobile homes was flooded. Five people died. Fires broke out. People were getting sh electrically shocked in the water. It brings it to life in a scary thing. But it was the night, and, and our farm was flooded. I, I had 17 buckets, five, 17 buckets, five gallon buckets in the kitchen to keep the water from 
from that was leaking through our roof to not destroy the floor in the house. But it was a funny thing. Uh, wrong button. And there was the rainfall pattern. It took us several months to do a, a bucket survey, literally going finding buckets or whatever containers we had, plus rain gauges. And this storm was really very localized. That's Fort Collins is very small compared to, to, to a, the, the Twin Cities area here, about, what, seven miles wide by maybe 10 miles north-south of the urbanized developing area. And the rainfall across the area was from just over, just about an inch on the east side of town to literally 14 and a half inches in one little part of Fort Collins, which happened to be the part where the water for that fell in this area flowed across town. You weren't supposed to see that. And flowed across town, flooded the campus, uh, and apparently they were able to claim, thanks to this analysis, that the flooding was a result of overland flow, not being flooded by a river flood, and that gave them leverage to collect their insurance instead of having the insurance reject their claim, which is what the insurance wanted to do. But, but that one map was used to save the university like tens of millions of dollars. Did I get any financial gain from that? No. <laughs> but but it, it, it certainly set off the purpose of Kokoraz. Uh, citizens were wildly interested. By the way, is there anything unusual about this photograph? What? Do you know how you get a, a double, double rainbow? <laughs> it's, it's a totally realistic comment, but it's in this case, and sorry for this diversion, we are not going to get done in the allotted, how much time do I have for this <laughs> talk? But, <laughs> uh, but is there a class coming in at three? Oh, good. I can go a little longer. Hoo -hoo. Uh, okay, you get a W-shaped rainbow when you get two suns. How do you get two suns? And in fact, this was a day that I decided climate change was something I was going to take real seriously because it was Loveland, Colorado, January of 2006. How? And, and if you're looking, if you know where Loveland is, it's just south of Fort Collins. If you have uh, a rainbow with mountains in the background, or at least a foothill in the background, uh, you're looking to the west. So that means you're looking at a sunrise. Sunrise, a rainbow at sunrise, snow doesn't make rainbows, rain does. And, and a reflection requires there to be very clear open water. There, with no waves on it. So there was a totally calm lake with sun reflecting off of the surface, which meant it wasn't frozen. And it, in January, all lakes are supposed to be frozen. And, and lo and behold, we got this amazing double rainbow, double, double rainbow. And but I, I love this photo. It's sort of been a trademark of, ever since one of our volunteers sent it to me. Uh, but we had a huge interest in, in trying to do something to improve precipitation data after, let's see, how do I do this?
literally stumbled into the animator. We, we didn't know, we didn't have, he, we just ran into him on the street. He was an old friend of one of our staff and he didn't even know he did this. And, and this guy has turned us around. He's done wonderful things for us. Oops, I'll do that. Uh, so I just wanted you to watch. In 1998, we started the project there in, in the Fort Collins area. This is gonna take the same day for each year for the last 21 years. 99, 2000, 2001, 2002, 2003. So the, we were a, a state volunteer network that was beginning to get a little traction. Actually, the drought of 2002 got us connected to our conservation districts, and our conservation districts took a huge interest in the program and launched it, and conservation districts have also been very important to the Minnesota networks over the years, very important. Then happened in 2003, we got a grant from the National Science Foundation and then things started to change. 2004, 2005, six, seven, eight, nine, who's the holdout? It, it, but why were you the, not represented? Because you already had the best network on the state level of any state. And we were just trying to figure out how to merge our networks. And we have still not fully in, integrated our networks, but we were definitely partially there. And someday, if we had all the data that you have in Kokoros, 
You'd be amazed at what shows up on these maps. It's amazing as it is. Okay, 2010, yeah, you're there, finally. Then look what happened. 2011, we're, all states are on board, but what happened after 2011 is we added Manitoba because they had a huge flood in 2011, huge flood that they said, we need more information. A lot of the floodwaters, of course, came from, you know, who, us, but also came from the headwaters of, of some of their rivers. And then gradually over time, Canada has grown and then relatively, yeah, 2016, you're at, you'll look off the coast of Florida, 2015. What's that? Bahamas. And if, I'm, okay, that would be, that would be Grand Bahama up there, it's closest. And then that one has, out, what's the, out, 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 what, what's the name? What's the, yeah, and unfortunately, we have no data from either of those two islands again now because of, guess what, this wildly destructive hurricane. In fact, we don't even know if a couple of the observers have not yet even been identified. So we, we may have lost observers. Very sad. 2019, and there we go. The, the coming soon is simply to let you know that these are very fast, simple maps but not very dynamic. We have a, a functionally dynamic system where you can put in a date range or zoom into any location and you can really do amazing things. It's just we're trying to get it right before we launch it publicly. And it's really hard to do everything perfectly. The power of volunteers is immense, is powerful, is beautiful, but not, but unfortunately there's not people everywhere. It's really hard to find people in like the Bonneville Salt Flats. But again, you look back on the national map, there's, we're, we're doing pretty good in some surprising places. Like desert areas of New Mexico are largely represented. Very d d dispersed areas of Wyoming are well represented. Utah and Nevada and are, are still problem areas. So you'll see there's a, a little bit of northern Minnesota that behaves a lot like northern Maine, which is pretty darn sparse when it comes to data. But I bet you know somebody that lives there, part of the year. By the way, the high school girl who served as our, what did they call her the, in that video, the, what, the Cotherized Education Leader when the high school kids were doing it. Uh, she now lives west of Bemidji and is a loyal reporter when she's not in divinity school. And she married a Bemidji State, uh, a meteorologist who teaches at, at Bemidji State, believe it or not. Pretty incredible. All right, there's a seasonal cycle to our reporting. Why would it dip in winter? Unless you're in New York State, New York State has the opposite signal. They get the most reports in winter, but they have, a, they have this lake effect loving community. Some people that move to the snow belts just for the winter to try to see how much snow they can get. That's another story. Uh, that's the accumulative number of, of observations. I think we're over 45 million precip observations have now been taken. Uh, demographics of our volunteers, largely an older audience, but uh, some students, more educators than I realize, or at least affiliated with educational organizations. That's probably based on a .edu kind of thing. Each point on the map, I, this is, those of you who have been involved in the co-op program or the Minnesota Observation Program know that each data point is a person with a story. And some of their stories are powerful. Some of their desires to help are immense. This guy was doing a voluntary snow core sample for us. We didn't, I mean, we, we, we sent the picture of what he was doing. He said, oh, you do that? You could die. <laughs> And furthermore, he had to take, carry hot water a long distance to, to be able to melt his sample. He, he didn't realize he could have just taken a scale and, and weighed it. And would have 
but he was trying his darndest. Uh, some simple keys to the success of Kozaraz has been the instrument accurate, easy to use, relatively low cost. The measurement of precipitation, especially rainfall, is very understandable. Snow a little more tricky. We've done our best with effective training. and We can't perfect it, but we've worked hard. And the data entry is relatively easy and relatively satisfying. We always have people complaining. Uh, but the, the data are quickly accessible and have been from the first day of the project in 1998. You enter your data, you can turn around and look at it in spatial context, and that's been a huge help. Uh, and furthermore, the data are used, and data used regularly, and the use of the data and the users of the data have helped propel, propel the project. National Weather Service, and they're so happy to have those of you sitting near the front of the room, became users of and advocates for the network at the same time, which really allowed that national expansion. If it wasn't for the National Weather Service caring about the data in most states and other state climate offices caring about the data in their states, we could not have launched a national program. It was out of the question. But it happened. And how the Bahamas happened was pretty amazing, too. And they did all their face-to-face -face training there. So it's pretty amazing. And Henry Regis has done most of our international work. Uh, and we've done as much as we can when we ran into this guy literally on the street. He did these animations for us for about $1,000 per minute, I think. But, but, it's really like, but then he gave us a 50% discount. <laughs> and, and it's well worth it, my heavens. Uh, and, I'm not, in the interest of time, I think I'll just skip over this one, but this one shows how we train, how we use animation to train. I can condense about an hour PowerPoint into about four minutes of video animation, and the same points come across well, and sometimes people even laugh. They don't really laugh that much when you read a, a, a volume document. We, there's Henry, our, na our national, oh, wait, wait a minute, what am I wearing? Only Henry would have gotten me to wear the funnel of the rain gauge on my head. Henry is our national and international coordinator. He's in Hawaii this week, and I've seen that several new folks in, in Hawaii have signed up this week, so he's being effective. Uh, we got, I'll show you another graph momentarily, social media, yes. We have, a, we have a real live help desk where there's a person there who is happy to answer the phone and still answers the phone and talks to people and writes the best email responses to questions, Noah Newman, friendly face, cheerful voice. We and we take our data quality very seriously. That means there's a bad data point on the map. And it'll, so, so we, People said, You're, why do you let that happen? Well, we don't want bad data to linger. So if it turns blue, everybody tells us about it uh, quickly. And within minutes, we often have a problem fixed. Uh, but we literally have a, we now have a full-time staff position supporting data quality. Do you communicate any with Danny? Danny Talmadge? then that's good. You have no data problem. <laughs> There's a bunch of us. Let's see. Oh, Luigi, you're in the product picture. Uh, this is some of our state climatologists actively involved in COSARAS around the country. Wonderful group. And, and from each you'll see every time there's a storm, there's a picture that we were able to paint from the map. That was Hurricane Sandy hitting in, in, oh, just about exactly seven years ago coming up. There was Hurricane Harvey, which was an amazing phenomenon with, I don't know how many, we had like over 20 stations, had over 40 inches of rain, including if you look at the scale of the map, that means somebody got 25 inches of rain that one day alone. The rain gauge holds only 11.3. That meant they had to be out checking and emptying it multiple times during the day. Missouri River flooding. You just got to show these pictures. 
this was one of our fantastic storms in, in March of 2003 that was well predicted days in advance. And we, in fact, one of my, the great stories that I, I went to a hardware store and found, well, I wasn't at the hardware store. Some, one of our volunteers told me about their experience in the hardware store. We sent an email in advance saying, you may get more snow than your rain gauge is possible, able to measure. And it gave them some recommendations that they could get a four, four foot length of four inch diameter PVC pipe and they could use that as a, as a longer way of getting a measurement. And lo and behold, somebody went to the hardware store to get some PVC and uh, the person in front of them had uh, also a, a length of PVC in their hand. And the one look, looked to the other and says, are you in Coco Rods? <laughs> <laughs> Two people in the same line were buying PVC at the same time preparing for this storm. And, and we were able to just watch the... plus inches in several areas and then the snow that day. Uh, but it, it's it's a much tougher measurement and some of our observers pack it in for the winter and I understand that and I'm not too hard on them but it's quite remarkable but even the big DC snowstorm of January 23rd of Feb, no Jan 23rd 2016 great data thanks to the volunteers. And hail, hail, hail. I do have a hail pad. They work. Styrofoam wrapped with aluminum foil does a great job of documenting the occurrences of hail. And I'm wrapping up here. That's a big accumulation of hail, by the way. We, we, there's a recent publication that we put out on deep hail and the study of deep hail, trying to document just how deep can it get. We try to maintain camaraderie as best we can. We, where we're able, we hold occasional gatherings. We had one here in, in Minnesota just a few years ago. Had a good group get together. Challenges? It's, the scary thing is we're now realizing we have to add about 4,000 new observers each year, or 4,000 new recruits just to hold even in our total number of reports, which is a lot of new volunteers. Now nationwide, it's a big country, but still that's a lot of volunteers. That works out to about 11 a day. We have to be recruiting. Uh, so that's a whole lot of recru recruiting. Takes time and staff, takes money. And I'll show you a money graph here in a moment. Uh, managing community is hard to do remotely. It's easier with social media and, and than it would have been otherwise, but still it's hard. Uh, and there's just a lot going on. Here is our because of our estimated budget by fiscal year. Our budget is peaked at around a half a million dollars a year for a volunteer network. How did we come up with that much money? Well, you'll see where how we came up with it. You'll see those first years when we started, we were in Colorado, getting some large support, just a few thousand dollars. Our first we built out nationally by then. Now the budget is shrinking a bit, but we're still maintaining staff. Without staff, Cocoraz could not have become what it was. Like having people to dedicate to this have been really important. And the funding, there you go. That is the grant funding. It's gone to zero. This is this color is the customer paying for data. We have people paying for the data. Most of the data are now being paid for. It's pretty good. And what's this part up here? Volunteer donations. Volunteer donations are now over a quarter of our budget and growing each year. And I have to do public fundraisers just like some other people that I know. Uh, and it's, but it's people are, I, we felt very bad about asking people to both donate their time to do observations and their money to keep the network going. But lo and behold, we, they, many people over, we get about 3,000 checks a year to help keep things going. 
pretty neat. Uh, thoughts, reflections, how do we end? It's the most fun, satisfying thing I've ever done in my life. I've had a great, fun career as is. Kokoraz has just added to it. Many wonderful friends and partnerships that have come. Some of you are in the room today. Uh, but every time I press a, the send button when I send out an email to the volunteers, which I do about once a month, it goes out to about 35,000 of my closest friends. <laughs> with, And all they have to do is hit reply, and it comes right back to me. And every time I, every time I sit there, oh, what am I going to face this time? And I get, I, I get interesting email, but people are very polite, and only about, I only get about 100 each time that reply that require a re that I feel require a response. I get several hundred responses, but I only reply to maybe a hundred. But it's great to be able to do that. And in my retirement, I can sort of do it, sort of. Uh, so with that, I want to come bring this to an end. Sorry about the long introduction. I was afraid it would become that, but it, I, then again, I'm not sorry about it. <laughs> We all have our stories, where we came from, how we got to where we're going, and that's my story. And it's, and I appreciate all of you who came to hear it today. So, and Earl, I wish he could be here. I mean, I first saw one of his maps of, of what he could do with analyzed rainfall data in the 1980s from a high density network. And I said, I want to be able to do something like that. And now we, we do it almost automatically. It's just a, a beautiful thing. And, uh, and to have had the connection with Earl's son, Al, for these many years has been fantastic. When I first walked into your classroom that first time, when I thought it was, I thought it was you, but I wasn't positive, and, uh, and just got this immediate sense of warmth and family, and not to mention that my dad looked a bit like Earl. And my dad uh, grew up in a small town outside of Wilmer, Minnesota. And there are still more Duskins in Minnesota than anywhere in the world. And I am related to all of them, but most of them are through, through distant cousin relationships. So I hope maybe a Duskin would show up. Is there a Duskin in the audience? No, I didn't think so. Oh, well. But thanks again for having me, and I'll field any questions that you feel like throwing at me. Yeah, it's, it's, not good. it's not that hard, but it's just been hard enough to not undertake. It's, and and we don't, neither of us want to mess up each other because we both have such good things going. But so we'll, my guess is we'll get integrated someday. We may need a grant from somebody to get integrated. I don't know. It's, it's a big enough effort that our, our computer person is like, ooh. <laughs> yes? Oh, boy. And if any, I have written messages to observers now for these many years, and we never talk climate change in Kokoraz. Well, not never. We rarely talk climate change in Kokoraz. We have some of the absolute most, well, you saw our age dynamic, our age demographics. We have a large percentage of folks that look like me from rural America. They're and, uh, conservative and very reluctant. Some of them very well educated as well, and still extremely reluctant to accept climate change as something that. Uh, and we also have a community of wildly, let's 
simply say we covered the full spectrum in our, in our volunteer program. And I have worked hard to try to keep the family together without letting climate change cause a divide. And we've succeeded in many ways, although every now and then something will happen and somebody will say, you, you talked about climate change, I quit. Or you didn't talk about climate change and I don't think you're on top of things. Uh, so we have very strong opinions and I try to gently tell farm stories instead. <laughs> uh, but but there's the, the, most, the movement has, has been steadily, and it's partly that the fact that the, the skeptics are gradually dying off or, or becoming less relevant in their roles in, in aid organizations. I mean, I, I was at the Colorado Onion Grower, or the U.S. Onion Growers Association meeting a couple of years ago, and the, the elders were all, I mean, I, I was grilled when I, I talked about climate change. And I was grilled and, and tried, and they wanted to publicly embarrass me. But in private, the younger folks who were not yet in the high level administrative positions in the organization said, we're listening, we just can't speak up yet. And, and there's a lot of that that's going on and, and, and the, there's, the speaking up is coming very soon. Uh, in many organizations. So the transition is occurring without, I, I gave up on, on convincing anybody some years ago. I simply show data and, 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 and let them reach their own conclusions because I couldn't affect change myself. And those that did, I mean, you, has Kevin Trenberth spoken? Has he been one of your? Kevin Trenberth has been has lectured here as well, and he was certainly on the on the we're in trouble side from 40 years ago. Well, probably he first started working on this in the 19 late 70s, probably even, and and he has been as outspoken for climate change and has changed very few minds. So it's been a t it's been a tough one, but the gradual communication and the increase in communication and, and the education is, I mean, and our current administration is probably gonna have as big of an effect on making things change faster than any other administration, if you can believe that. That's my own opinion. But it's, it's a tough one, tough question, tough answer. And it's hard to believe I really was on, on This American Life. I forgot all about that. And I, I never knew that was happening until it happened. Well, that happens with the news. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. And right. my contractor left me a message. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to listen later. <laughs> <laughs>